Hi everyone, my name is Caroline and together with Raymond we welcome you to this webinar. I'm really curious from where you're watching and which time zone you're in. Today we'll talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the leisure sector. First we will look back, what have the last couple of months been like, but then we will look forward, what will the future hold and how can businesses adapt. We will start with the presentation, but afterwards there's plenty of time to answer your questions, so please write them down and send them to us, so we can address them. I hope you agree that we chose quite a bold statement for this session, but we think that COVID-19 could actually be the savior of the leisure industry. We think it will be the end of overcrowded theme parks or visitor destinations, where people have to wait for hours or can hardly see a painting in a museum because there are people in front of them. A part of the industry won't survive and they will have to close their doors for eternity. Since working from home has become normal and also apparently actually seems to work and shopping online even for groceries has become a serious alternative, retail centers will become more and more empty. But why would all this actually mean the savior of the industry? Before we elaborate further on this notion, we would like to briefly inform you about our field of work. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you for attending our webinar. My name is Raymond Oudegroen, and I am the co-owner of Imagine Leisure. Imagine Leisure is a one-stop development shop for leisure projects. We create, develop, and operate leisure facilities throughout Europe. From dream to reality, we take our clients by the hand and guide them through the whole process of setting up a leisure venue. Our work is always customized to the client's needs. We create unique, authentic concepts, set up capital businesses, acquire existing venues, and also work on improving existing visitor attractions, either through better marketing, new investments, working more efficiently, creating new revenue streams, and so on. For this, we work with the best industry partners in the world. We can even operate with our designated operating company. As you can see, Imagine Leisure truly delivers turnkey. Well, I think everyone will agree with me. It's been a bizarre year. The beginning looked so incredibly promising. These articles give a good impression of how we were looking at 2020 at the beginning of this year. Theme parks that were about to open new rides or shows museums or expansion of museums that were opening in 2020. And on a much smaller scale here in the Netherlands, the cheese experience was about to open its doors for the first time at the end of March after an intensive time of realizing this new attraction. Also Flory World was planned to open this year, which is an attraction about how flowers are produced in the Netherlands and exported all over the world. Many leisure destinations reported a significant growth in visitor numbers. And believe it or not, I can't even imagine it myself, but we were talking about over-tourism on certain locations. But then Covid came, and I think in almost every country there was a form of a lockdown. For weeks or even months, a lot of facilities were forced to close, and the steps to reopen were, or are, very uncertain. Well, this of course had a big impact on the budget and the prognosis of this year, since there was absolutely no income anymore. And most businesses or institutions have been forced to adjust their budget. The effect is shown on various levels, like on a local theme park or a city, but also as a country as a whole. And to illustrate this, uh, this graph shows the incoming tourism to the Netherlands over the last decades. And as you can see, it's been growing year after year, and the forecast showed another 50% increase by 2030. Unfortunately, recent numbers showed the dramatic fall in tourism, because we were expecting 22 million visitors, but only 6 million tourists will be coming to the Netherlands this year. Only 6 million. A dramatic fall, which naturally can be seen worldwide. The era of COVID-19 had begun. Let's go back to the beginning of this new era, March 2020. The first casualties occurred in China. 
But like a mega quake, the impact of the virus was massive globally within just a couple of weeks. Lockdowns everywhere, governments closing down cities, airports, theme parks and museums. There was complete chaos and thus panic amongst leisure operators. Millions of euros, dollars or pounds going down the drain. No governmental support yet, no work, no guests, nothing. We all know the dramatic images of empty theme parks, museums and cities. At that moment there was just one thing you could do. Controlling the damage. Don't go bankrupt. Call your bank, landlord, investor. Inform your staff, set up a crisis team and try to gain control over this new unexpected situation. Damage control turns into crisis management. Lobbying for financial support. Put your staff on furlough. Refinancing your debts. Postponing investments. Rescheduling maintenance. But also keeping in touch with your audience to stay relevant and as much as top of mind as possible. And in the meanwhile, getting ready for reopening whenever that would be and knowing that the season is lost already. However, some of the operators were seizing the moment to create new opportunities and business models. There are many inspiring examples of companies or individuals staying in touch with their audience during lockdown. I think everyone has seen uh, the concerts of, for example, Coldplay seen here, who performed live from home, which fans could enjoy from their own home. But also other examples were very inspiring, like Disney sharing their recipes so that guests could make their cakes and meals themselves. Many museums gave virtual tours or provided online courses, and zoos all around the world show their feeding of the animals, and I actually saw animals walking around the park themselves. This is a very creative and inspiring example of one of our Dutch entrepreneurs. Visitors used to come to the location, and by interacting with the actors, guests have to try to escape from a prison. Rick, who is the founder and owner, has been able to transform this incredibly fast to an online game where people are still interacting live with the actors, which are at the location. They've added some real cool elements, which make the experience very exciting. It's not only a great example of ways to transform your business, but also a great game to play, so I really recommend you try it yourself. Not only does the impact of COVID-19 vary between sectors, like for example there's a difference between retail, transportation or finance, but even within the leisure sector there's a lot of difference. First of all, there's a difference between countries. Here in the Netherlands we had a intelligent lockdown, whatever that may be, but it meant that a lot of things still remained open and we were allowed to go outside. Other countries, it was a full lockdown and people weren't even allowed to go outside their homes. The extent to which the government has supported or continues to support businesses, and specifically the leisure sector, also varies greatly. This is particularly challenging for international companies that have venues in several countries, like Merling, for example. It also applies to the regulations that apply for facilities to reopen, even on a regional level. Like, for example, we've worked on reopening trampoline parks and each region assessed this activity differently. Sometimes it was sports, sometimes it was playing. So in one region they were allowed to open and in the other province not. A second cause for the large differences within the sector is the seasonal development. When most countries went into lockdown in March, some leisure facilities like uh, wellness and indoor ski slopes, they just had finished their season. This made the first lockdown less difficult for them, but at the same time, the next coming months is the time for high season. The exact opposite season goes for attractions like theme parks and zoos. They have most visitors, of course, in spring and summer, so lockdown hit them hard. And that certainly applies to the attractions that are closed during winter, like uh, the beach pavilions here in the Netherlands, which are only open from March till October. In winter, they have all the expenditure and maintenance and the preparations for opening, and then there was no opening at all. 
For cultural facilities like museums and theaters, they attract less visitors in summer or have no programming in summer at all, which was precisely the time when in most countries the restrictions were minimal. The final cause for the large difference within the sector has to do with the way the business is structured. You can imagine that a new museum or attraction, like ones I've mentioned earlier, they felt a great effect of the lockdown because they haven't been able to build up a buffer and they were supposed to actually generate income. It's also more difficult for facilities that are standalone to get through a crisis like this than a chain because within a chain, budgets can be divided or shifted over various locations. And there's a scalability with regard to costs or personnel. We already addressed the third bullet, the extent to which a company is able to transform its business. Many hotels were creative in deploying their staff on maintenance rather than preparing food or occupying the reception. And other hotels started offering workplaces instead of a night to sleep. The last two aspects have to do with the way the business case is structured. Part of the sector was faced with reclamation of tickets, like for example for theater performances, concerts or events, but of course also airline tickets and holidays. This puts enormous pressure on the cash flow, and the same applies for the sources of income. If an institution is largely based on subsidies, they should hardly have felt the effect compared to one that depends on public income or sponsorship. This brings us to the first conclusion of the impact on the business. Because the impact varies so much between the types of leisure facilities, we will see a big shift in the next couple of years in concepts, operators or amount of leisure providers. Because let's be honest, not every type of leisure activity is able to transform its business completely. Take a wellness center, they can hardly make it an online experience or create a business case based on an occupancy of only 20% or something. Therefore, unfortunately, this will not result in a happy ending for everyone. But we do think that new concepts and brands will arise and that businesses that are strong will be able to adapt. So have we already seen such signals in the market recently? If you look at last summer, some parts of the industry have been able to recover. For example, campings or holiday parks did really well and were fully booked. Of course, mainly with domestic tourists. For destinations that were already strong in attracting local or national visitors, this was a very good summer. But on the other hand, businesses that are dependent on international tourists were struggling. If we compare outdoor to indoor, we really see that outdoor activities performed better, which is kind of logical since outdoor felt a lot safer than indoor. Also, indoor activities have been restricted, mostly in every country, to a certain amount of visitors. For example, one of our clients is a small outdoor theme park called the Fairy Tale Forest, and it's situated in the south of the Netherlands. And he actually had record-breaking numbers of visitors this summer. But at the same time, there were hardly any international tourists in, for example, Amsterdam, and all museums there saw a big decline in visitor numbers. For museums and theaters, it's extra challenging because they have a limited capacity. One of the museum's directors I talked to recently from a museum in The Hague said that he was almost fully booked every day, but at the same time, he had to disappoint almost 100 visitors a day because they didn't reserve a time slot and couldn't go in. And he said that this is not a profitable business case at all with this occupancy rate. So, where are we now? After just six months, the world has completely changed and the impact on our industry is severe. Bankruptcies everywhere, but are they actually all COVID related? Or was this just the final push? We believe that at least 80% of these bankruptcies were already heading there and COVID-19 just speeded things up a bit. Well-managed venues should be able to survive and adapt with or without governmental support. As I mentioned earlier, new formats were invented with or without new or existing technologies. Time slots, free bookings, package deals, online experiences, VIP, even premium pricing occurred, and most important, competitors working together to survive, struggling but getting there.
Although the government tries to keep as many people as possible at work, we are already seeing quite a few layoffs and reorganization at various companies. I mean, Disney recently announced that it would cut no fewer than 28,000 jobs. This has an effect on the income of the population, which in turn will lead to a changing market. We see that in any case, the population will have less to spend. In a previous crisis, the financial crisis, we've learned that this leads to a decrease in long distance travel. And that means that a lot of people will stay more in the region or in their own country. At the same time, people will still want to continue doing fun things, and that will lead to an increase in day trips or short weekends away, which is a great opportunity for leisure facilities. A good example of this is a previous economic crisis in which cinemas performed better than in previous years. There was a great demand for a short break or getting away from the daily grind, and that's where cinemas profited from. But even so, people will be doing much more from home. And this requires companies to make a transition. It will become increasingly important to ensure that facilities will look at the entire customer journey. They have to try to bind the visitors that normally only come to the location in an earlier stage of the customer journey and try to make them stick to the brand longer. This brings us to the key question of how companies can survive this COVID crisis. First of all, we're convinced that almost all leisure facilities should rethink their business model to ensure that they can offer a great experience to the customer, not only in the short, but also in the long term, and that they can manage this also financially. If you're not already working on it or have been working on it, look with your team to see what's still possible regarding to offering new activities or services. I know it's a challenge, but think outside the box. I mean, a visitor doesn't start her customer journey when he or she arrives at your website or at the location. The visit doesn't end when he or she leaves the museum, theater or zoo. And an experience cannot translate one-on-one -on -one to something digital. Recently, I spoke to someone from a large international dance company, and it turned out that they are actually trying to copy the experience in the theater to a live stream. It was a bit disappointing to hear because there was no thought about who they wanted to reach and what the purpose was of the live streaming. Quite unfortunate because by adding things you can only see via the live stream, you can actually increase the value of watching it at home. Like for example, a backstage tour or an interview with one of the artists. The last couple of months, we ourselves have been working on a concept for a beautiful old city hall. And in the development of the concept, we've already taken into account the sizes of groups, the customer flow, and making sure that you can keep your distance and still make it profitable. We also see some amazing new digital improvements, like uh, we've mentioned already the time slots that almost every museum, zoo or wellness center has introduced. Uh, but I've also already seen more examples of dynamic pricing, that makes not only the business more flexible, but it could also redirect visitors to another time or another day. It's really good to see that a crisis like this pushes innovations and technological improvements that are actually here to stay. Which is the second reason why we think this crisis will actually improve the industry. It will give an enormous boost on technology, pricing strategies and the guest experience. The second advice is based on the experience of a number of our customers. They told us that during this crisis, they ensured that every step of the way was re-examined, both in terms of contact with the customer, the way that their marketing was conducted, and even up to every euro that was spent. This has given a major boost to the development of their facilities, but it actually also saved a lot of money. So over the next few months, Ask yourself, why are we doing this? Does this fit with who we are and what we want to achieve? It could actually provide some surprising answers. The third advice has to do with the value that we give to leisure facilities. In recent years, the price level for attractions, museums, theaters and amusement park has increased only marginally in Europe and in some cases, the net price even has fallen due to the many discounts. 
We think, but also hope, that the crisis will lead to a revaluation of leisure, that the appreciation will increase, both from the customer's point of view, but also from the provider, and more importantly so from the perspective of real estate developers. Because leisure has so much more value than it's been given up till now. I've talked to a lot of people by now, but I still don't understand why big platforms that everyone complains about because they give so much discount, they still exist. The last advice, connecting with your guests, government, competitors or suppliers, may be obvious. But we see in many situations that this has received little attention in the recent months. Companies and institutions have had limited contact with their customers. So they received hardly any information about their needs, wishes and concerns. Quite logical, because everyone was working with crisis management. But the relationship with, for example, the suppliers, your competition, government or other types of partners can ensure that you look from a different perspective. Or it could result in a very nice new collaboration. So put this on the agenda for the next couple of months and work on connecting with your partners. So yes, we really believe that COVID-19 is the savior of the leisure industry and that the sector will come out of this much stronger. But only if it focuses on the adjustments that are taking place in the market. But in recent months, we've already seen how much creativity there is and how inspiring entrepreneurs are able to innovate. As a result, we think we'll see many new formats, concepts and brands in the coming years. The really strong entrepreneurs and business models will survive this and will be more highly valued, both from the customer and the company itself. The demand for leisure facilities from a real estate development perspective will only increase because this is one of the few means to attract visitors to a specific location or a destination. It's the end of overcrowded places, discounts of 50% or more, or cheap rip-offs from great concepts. This will actually make the sector better. We're looking forward to it, both literally and figuratively speaking. This truly is the moment to reinvent your business and be prepared for a new era, life after COVID. It will change our whole perspective. There will be a whole new world for the leisure industry. All right, that's it for the presentation. Time for questions. I'm really curious to hear what kind of questions everyone has.